Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so um, we're going to run through very quickly um, some calibration concepts, and I'm going to give uh, my colleague uh, Bart, wait, 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 I wrote down in phonetics how to say his name, and now I can't find it in my notes. Oh, Bart, I'm sorry. Skill parut. Skill parut. Skill parut from uh, TU Delft. And I'm going to use my timer so that I don't go into his time. Okay, so calibration. Um, again, the DTS gives you photons, not temperature. That's all you're measuring is photons. Um, the our, when we calibrate, it's going to define our precision. The DTS defines our resolution. Uh, and the and we'll, calibration will also define it. We'll look at our accuracy as well. Okay, so calibration is going to require some kind of independent measurement of temperature. We can. We can use default parameters in this equation below um, that we might have some idea of the differential attenuation of an optical fiber from a manufacturer or something like that. And that'll give us temperatures probably within, I don't know, a few degrees centigrade of the truth, maybe five or 10 degrees centigrade. And if you're interested in you know, flame temperatures or the temperature of the sun, then that's pretty good. But most of us in our environmental world are interested in having um, temperatures that are that have an accuracy of uh, down at least down in the tenths of degrees centigrade, if not uh, hundreds of degrees centigrade or or tens of millikelvin, uh, and in order to to back out things about process uh, processes in the field. Okay, so our goal is going to be to again we I've changed I's for uh, to P's now. These are the power of the of the uh, Stokes and anti Stokes coming back, and we have essentially. Um, three parameters, gamma term C and delta alpha in our equation. And indeed, DTS systems do drift. And I just want to show you, this is an example. These are real data. Um, the green is a, a distributed temperature. No, the, sorry. The blue is a distributed temperature sensor uh, at a particular temperature, at a particular point on a cable. And the green is an independent temperature sensor um, at that same point in the cable. Okay. And you can see when we left the instrument, all was perfect. They were perfectly calibrated. They, in fact, we calibrated the DTS based on the green temperature and all was well, okay? Over time though, and this is uh, over a, what, a, a two month period, you can see there was a significant drift, okay? Things moved apart and it, and it was not consistent, okay? The, the DTS went, uh, went hot, then went cold and then got even colder, okay? So that's why we have to calibrate and indeed, we can, okay? With calibration, we can bring, match these two and make sure that we are um, in the right spot all the time, okay? So our calibration equation, this is, um, this is a very simplified one. We are assuming that the differential attenuation along the optical fiber is constant in space. Not necessarily in time, we can allow it to change in time, but it's gonna be the same value all the way in, in space. And John just showed you or told you um, the idea of connectors are going to give us a variable attenuation in space. So if you have lots of changes in attenuation in space, you're going to want to listen to what Bart's going to have to tell you on how to get around that. Okay. So gamma is something about the instrument laser itself. Uh, the parameter C is both about the sensors and the laser and the differential attenuation delta alpha is a function of the optical fiber itself and the wavelengths of which we're firing. This gamma term should be about 500, it's, it should be a, a, a constant, a known value. It should be just about 500 degrees Kelvin, depends on the uh, uh, laser that we're using as far as what wavelengths we're using, but that should be. Um, we found that it's useful to allow this to be a calibration parameter, to let it float, okay? It adds one more uh, requirement of one more calibration bath, so you'll have three baths at least, but it helps. Okay, uh, again, the value C, uh, we can think about it as a, a, a function of the instrument, uh, instrument as well as some other properties. Um, we tend to treat it as a function of time because certainly the lasers do drift, okay? And the differential attenuation, again, we've talked about this. It is this alpha term in the attenuation in Beer's law. And it is the, out, the difference in attenuation between the two wavelengths, okay? so. And here's, I just wanna show you an example. I showed you earlier an example of what the optical, um, the Stokes and anti-Stokes signals would look like as a function of distance. Uh, and let's, this is a case of, let's say we had a connector right at this point. We had two cables that were connected together or 
kind of a fusion splice right there. And what we see is light loss um, on the way back. There's light loss on the way going out, of course. We don't see that, but we see the light coming back. And as that light is coming back from 1,000 meters, okay, um, we, as it's here, we're getting a lot more light coming back. We cross through this, this, this loss, this um, two connectors together. We no longer have as much light going out, nor do we have as much allowed to come back. Okay, so it acts as kind of a valve on the system. And because the attenuation may be different in the uh, Stokes frequency than the anti-Stokes frequency, it would produce a step change in temperature across that junction, even though there is no change in, uh, I'm assuming there's no change in temperature in the truth in the cable. Okay, the cable's all at the same temperature. So when you see these kinds of things in your temperature signal, that I ah, see this step drop in temperature and you don't think it's real or you can see where it is on the fiber and say, ah, I have a connector there. Then we need to start working about, worrying about how to fix that. And there are some simple ways to do it and then there's some slightly more complex ways to do it, but we can get rid of that. But if you see a whole bunch of these chunk, 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 all the way down, uh, you're in trouble, okay? You're, you're gonna have a, there's something on your cable. Go out and walk along the cable and see, is it bent around something? Is it pinched? And if it is bent, straighten it out and you'll get rid of most of these problems, most of them, okay? Um, so in reality, our calibration equation looks much more like this, where this differential attenuation term is actually um, an integral. It's the change in the uh, differential attenuation, which is a function of distance by dz. Okay, and Bart's gonna talk more about using this integral form and how we can uh, uh, easily use the integral form. Okay, so how, how do we calibrate? We have one or more reference sections. We have three, uh, three unknowns in our simple equation, it would mean we need to have, have a minimum three places on the optical fiber where we know the temperature, okay? Um, typically in any DTS system you buy, there will be some kind of a onboard calibration system, a simplification. Usually there's some fiber that's actually inside the instrument that is used to help calibrate, uh, uh, to uh, deal with temperature fluctuations of the instrument itself. Most of those are proprietary. Okay, so you won't really know what's going on. This is the kind of the three different ways we can configure a, a optical fiber for DTS use in the field. Okay, here's our DTS. We can do something called simplex. So that's where we have one fiber in an optical fiber cable and it goes out and it stops. Okay, in this case, I've got three calibration baths. So I've got three calibrations, three, three uncertain parameters in my calibration equation. I can calibrate this. But what's more common is that we have um, a duplexed measurement. And it's very rare that we buy a, a a uh, fiber optic cable that has only one fiber in it. Usually there's multiple, two or four usually, it can be even more. So why not use both of those, okay? So if I have my installation out in the field and I go out to the end of the cable, which now has two fibers in it, if I take those two fibers and splice them together at the end, that's my U there at the end, and bring it all the way back, well now I have, I've doubled my length of optical fiber, and now I can put two calibration baths here and I get four places on, the, on this loop of cable where I get the uh, calibration, okay? I have introduced maybe some kind of a splice, a step loss out here, not good. I could also just take the cable, the single cable and just loop it around physically, okay? It'd be more expensive to do that. But again, using both fibers that are in, the, in, in a typical cable or four, you glue them together like that or fuse them, you get more. That's duplexed, but still single-ended. I've only interrogated the cable from one direction. A double-ended measurement uses that same duplexed cable, okay? But now I take one laser pulse and I shoot it down the optical fiber this way and let it come all the way back. I pass through four calibration baths. Then I go to the next channel on the DTS and I interrogate the cable the other direction. Okay, and I come back around and I convolute those two signals together. And when I do that, I can now actually calculate the differential attenuation as a function of distance along the optical fiber. I can get that integral form, okay? So this is advantageous and it, it, I always, we always recommend doing this. You uh, do a duplex measurement, you collect in both directions, 
we don't recommend you do the um, putting the two signals together in the instrument. Keep them separate. So keep one channel, keep the other's channel, put them together when you get home. Okay, that's easier. Uh, it's it's harder actually, but it's better to do that. And here's the difference you get between a single-ended and a double-ended measurement. A single-ended measurement, the the noise, okay, the signal to noise. Um, the noise increases as I go further down the cable. Why? Because I have less photons way at the end of the cable and I have less photons coming back. So I'm simply not counting as many. Whereas here, I'm getting a lot of information back. So I have better resolution. And the, the noise scales as a function of the square root of the number of photons I collect roughly, okay? So that's great. You get good information close, your noise gets worse at the other end. With a double-ended measurement, Okay, there's the reverse. Now I go the other way on that same cable, I get lots of, I get really high resolution here and noisy at the other end. When I put those two together in a double-ended measurement, I end up with my most uh, uh, least noisy signal in the center of the cable and the noisiest signals are now at the two ends. So, and, and I've exaggerated this noise. It looks much worse than it is, uh, but recognize that if you're really interested in measuring things, close into your optical, to the, your instrument, sorry, just my timer stopped, um, then, uh, you know, think about a single-ended measurement or don't think about putting the two measurements together. Okay, you have them there. So the objective of calibration is to calculate the known correct temperature, remove these offsets, remove drift, and improve your accuracy. Okay. All right. Um, and it's nice if we can quantify our resolution and accuracy, that's even better. So we can actually say how accurate is our measurement, which means we need to know the temperature with some other instrument that is really accurate or is, is more accurate. And our resolution will tell us how noisy our signals are. All right. Okay, um, the single-ended calibration, again, assumes that uniform calibration parameters in space. We can do a calibration every time we take a measurement. So it's not, constant in uniform in time, but in space. It's good for short cables where we don't have much step losses. Okay, and again, it can handle these, those step losses well. We can handle one or two, okay? And again, three, three unknowns, gamma, C, and delta alpha requires at least um, three reference temperatures. And two of them need to be different, at least. Otherwise you can't invert the matrix. So here's commonly what we would do. We'd have a DTS. We'd put our cable through a cold bath, a, a warm bath. This is a, 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 a duplexed measurement. We'd go out to what we're measuring. And if we're, if we're lucky enough, put some cable out in another cold bath or a warm bath someplace out in the field. And when I say some, you typically wanna have at least 10 or 20 me DTS measurement points in your calibration bath. So if your instrument is re returning a signal every one meter, you wanna have 10 meters, 20 meters in, in these baths. Okay, um, and this is, while it may look hard to do, it's not that hard to do. Let's say you're in a stream environment. You coil up a bunch of cable at the end, you throw it into a, a big cooler, which you cover, which you keep well mixed, but you don't have to have constant temperatures in time. You just have to have te known temperatures. So you can have a thermometer in here and be measuring that temperature over time and use that for calibration. Okay. We used to use ice baths, which was really kind of tough because keeping ice, with the exception of Ted Scambos, uh, Ted's problem is keeping water at his site, but um, ice is a, you don't need to have ice. Okay. Again, you just have to have these well mixed. Okay, uh, the calibration gap baths will give us an, air, an idea of our root mean squared error. It's a measure of our precision. And if we have one other bath that we don't use in our calibration procedures, then that tells us our bias. And that tells us is some measure of our, the true accuracy of our temperature measurement, okay, of our DTS. Okay, root mean squared is the difference between observed and calibrated temperatures. Um, and the bias is, is squared, square root of that. And the bias is simply the arithmetic difference between our observed temperature at an independent place. Um, okay, how do I improve, how do I reduce noise? I sample longer. Scott, just a heads up, you're about halfway through your share yep, time. Yep. With I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right at this point to give Bart um, some time. Right. So um, long, so you average longer over, you sample longer over time, fire the laser more often, accumulate more photons. 
your noise will decrease uh, as the square root of time in that case. Or I can increase my sample interval. So instead of sampling at one meter, I sample at two meters. Well, I get twice as many photons from those two meters. I get less spatial resolution, but I can increase, I can improve my noise level. Okay. So both of those uh, are ways to reduce noise if you have a really noisy signal. Typically, though, we want to sample things in space as often as possible. And in time, uh, that depends on what you're doing. But in time, the one key factor to have, and then I'm going to stop, is that you want to have, you want to be averaging over a time period in which the cable or the places on the cable are not changing in time, right? So your sampling interval has to be shorter than the characteristic time of things changing in the field. So, you know, if clouds are coming, you're, if you're out on the soil surface and you're measuring, it's a cloudy day. Well, you know, every minute or two a cloud comes over, you want to sample shorter than that. If you're in the ice in Ted Scambolis's case, the ice isn't changing temperature, you could, you could measure for two hours in the ice itself and integrate that and, 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 uh, and be comfortable that the cable wasn't changing over your calibration time. Okay, I'm gonna stop at that point and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Bart to talk about double-ended calibration. And the, the, the group at Delft has been working on some really neat stuff uh, on uh, calibrating noisy and lossy or noisy and lossy DTS data. 